what did you think about the process? Let's go back a little bit coming out of Octopus and now you're moving into Glass House and now you're moving into Power and the Glory. And again, yep. these are kind of concept albums, right? And Glass House on the heels of Octopus. Yeah. Power and the Glory on the heels of Glass House. And I wondered, were, were those discussed, these concepts, or were they just sort of kind of happening as the pieces were being written? Um, they, no, they were discussed as concepts uh, from, the, from the word go. You know, Raymond would say, this is what the album's going to be about. Um, and, and he and, and Kerry then would go off and start writing stuff. And the last thing to be done was the lyrics. Um, by then, of course, uh, um, uh, Derek would be would have written everything within that concept. Uh, but a lot of the time when we did the rehearsals for the backing tracks, uh, it would there were there were no lyric lyrics available. They weren't done. But we knew they, they were concept things. Of course, one of the major things was was Phil deciding to leave the band. That was a that was that was a big thing. That um, because uh, Derek and Ray did consider folding the band at that time. We had a meeting in Milan, and uh, we decided that uh, we would we would in fact carry on. That we could handle it between the five of us. And, I mean, you had, the only thing we were missing was uh, one of the, the lyricists. So Phil wasn't writing music at all? He was writing lyrics? Yeah, I do believe so. Uh, I don't think, he might have been writing the odd thing with odd bits and pieces or putting ideas in with, with Raymond, but um, I don't, I don't think so. I think he was, he and Derek did uh, the, the lyrics mostly. Um, so, was, so were you concerned about losing the horns? What, what, what was the, the thing about losing Phil? Was it sort of a spiritual leader in a way? Um, well, Phil was 10 years older than the rest of us. So we used to call him Uncle Bill. Did he like that? <laughs> <laughs> he never heard it. <laughs> <laughs> he called him Uncle Bill behind his back. But he and uh, he was the kind of leader of the band. And he and Derek were always at the loggerheads, uh, forever arguing. You know, um, when, when he left, all that was lifted. That all disappeared, that black cloud of, of family feuding. And they really went at it, I think, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> when I heard them go first time, I thought, whoa, hang on. What have I got myself into here? Wow. And that, that was actually in the, the audition that I did in Portsmouth. They had a go at each other about something. <laughs> whoa. And Gary turned around and he said, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> They're always like this. Because it sounded like they were about to kill each other. And it, it was brothers, you know. Yeah. It's, it's like that. But, <laughs> but it never went there physically? Uh, no, 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 no. Not at all. That's great. You know, uh, I think my first giant record was Power and the Glory. But the first one that I experienced in real time and you'll probably remember this is in new york freehand was a big record so that meant that just the same on reflection and freehand were in steady rotation on new york wnew fm radio yeah maybe that rings a bell because that was the station where you would hear giant oh but yes it, it was our mainstream rock station so they'd go from, you know, Bill Withers to Sly 
to Genesis, to Yes, to Gentle Giant, to Mahavishnu, to, you know, everything was on the table then. And I just have such fond memories of being in middle school and hearing Giant just come on the radio. And I think that that's always going to be something that, that only a few of us really had. Because now, in a way, Giant's rediscovery, and this is, I'm sure you're very pleased to, to, to be around to see that the level of appreciation for Giant's music has grown over the years. Mm -hmm. And the reissues with the bonus material, with the live stuff, with the surround, with the, you know, the isolation has only proven, I think, more and more what a quality band Giant was. So tell me a little bit about that. I mean, because you've been involved a little bit in the Freehand uh, promotion for the new release of uh, the re-release of Freehand. And mm -hmm. some of the other guys have come on for that as well. How do you feel about where appreciation is for Giant now as to where it was when you guys stopped in 80? Well, I'm, I'm really, really thrilled about it because uh, with the advent, with everything changing in, in 78, you know, and all the, all the prog bands start to, you know, either go pop or get in the woodwork, you know, hide away. Yeah. Um, I was very disappointed then. Uh, I mean, we had to, we followed the trend. We really did, uh, thinking that if we get a hit album, uh, then the back catalogue will get looked at. And maybe we could, this is what we always thought, and maybe we could wean them back in. So it was very disappointing to, uh, if we'd have been given another couple of years, I think, uh, we would have become a lot more popular then. Uh, but to see it happen now and to get young people, you know, uh, reviewing the, the records and going, wow, what is this? <laughs> My grandfather went to see this band and, and told me all about them. You know, it's it's lovely. It's it's very pleasing, and it's made me revisit the albums. I mean, five years ago, I hadn't. I used to have a, a little binge every now and then, where I'd sit down with a couple of glasses of beer and and go through the catalogue and go, oh yeah, oh. Yeah, <laughs> just one, once, once every couple of years, but I'm doing it more often now. But I'm very, very pleased to, to see it. It's, it's great, especially young people. I've uh, gotten more than a few young people to listen to Gentle Giant, and I, I have uh, very much enjoyed their response because I think that they don't know that rock music could have gone there mm. you know sort of the early music influence that carrie brought in yeah and then the more uh i don't know progressive rock if you will of, of ray and and the subject matter i always say to my students uh you know when when the music started getting more unusual and complicated well, you couldn't really still sing i love you baby come back to me so yeah, what yeah. are you going to sing about? You know, it's such a, it's a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you sing about mythology. Maybe you sing about psychology. Maybe you sing about, you know, more subtle matters. And I lo always love that about Giant because they, you know, they found their own way of telling a story. What is your favorite piece on Freehand? On freehand, uh, his last voyage, for sure, because that is so diverse. It covers a lot of things. And my favorite bit is that sleazy guitar solo uh, <laughs> and that, that little, 
what I like about that section is is just before the guitar solo comes in, it's playing uh, playing a drum break back to front, starting loud and using dynamics to come right down. Yeah. To the end of it, I just love doing that. Well, hammer in the first band I was ever in. I used to just hammer all night, and the guitar player said, "Have you ever heard the word dynamics?" I said, "No, what's that?" Then? <laughs> and he said, "That's when you play a little bit quieter in a quieter spot." And I never forgot that. Yeah. And that's what I love about that track, uh, or one of the things I really like about it is using that the dynamics in in those drum breaks just before the guitar solo. And then off he goes, Mr. Green. Oh, hold this. And that slur up uh, in, along with one, one of the breaks I play with a grab on the end. Uh, killer. I love it. And I want to say, though, for me, Last Voyage, the big payoff when finally the, th you know, the three lines with you bashing, you know, that grab right that Which grab because you never knew exactly where it was when you were in the intro right we hear That's these right. lines they're kind of floating along uh -huh. but, but we don't know that it's this you know down, 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 deck it down, 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 deck it down, right? So it's really a lot of fun when that recap comes. And yeah. then, of course, back to the gentle after that. Yeah, it's it's a superb piece. Uh, but see, this is this is the re a record for me I could go on and on about because it also has mobile, which I think yeah. is a piece that has is just one of the great giant pieces, deep cut. Yeah. And another triplet feel. You guys with three, you know, you were you were just so deft at using different types of three. Mm -hmm. Like on on Raconteur Troubadour, you know, ba 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 two three one two three one th you know, it was all the different subdivisions could go on. Yeah. Ba 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 ba. You know, it was different types of three. And these are all ideas I stole just right from Gentle Giant. <laughs> stole, just stole left and right. Because, <laughs> because what was the thing about Giant that you made clear to me was 4-4 four, four can have plenty of surprises. Sure. And if you understand that, you know, simplicity and complex, you can't have complexity without simplicity. And you don't really have simplicity if you have all complexity. And mm -hmm. I like that, uh, that range. And you did, you had the dynamic range, stuff would get really quiet, stuff could be really heavy. So I learned a lot from Giant in just as a musical unit. I won't even say, putting aside the fact that I love the sound of the music, the 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 uh, the uh, ethos of the band was really what what I think landed on musicians like myself. Mm. Was uh, these guys, you know, they're not going to be repeating themselves. They're going to give you a wide range of instrumentation. They're going to be very dynamic. They're going to you know have multiple vocal ideas going mm -hmm. on. So it really was, uh, in the words of Frank Zappa. A very high level of statistical density. <laughs> <laughs> but because John Weathers is back there, man, it just it it always felt so good. And I would think that if you were like on some of those big shows where it was you, yes, and Griffin and Frampton, I think there were there were some really big stadium shows. I would think uh, that am I correct in that? Uh Griffin wasn't one on them. Uh, the the there were two big ones we did, one in LA and one in um, San Diego, where it was uh, Yes, Top of the Bill, Frampton, uh, Gary Wright, and a Sultan in the show. And those were great, great concerts. Uh, 
they were half day concerts with um, so we'd be on at like uh, oh, two o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. Yeah, but they they were great great shows. And sort of a peak moment too for, I won't say progressive music, but music in general, where you could have a a, a program like that, where mm -hmm. it's giant. Yes, Gary Wright and uh, Frampton, and such a an, you know diverse range, and the audience was happy to hear it all. Oh yeah, it was great. When I think we played the Dodgers Stadium, didn't we? Yeah. In LA. And right up in the gods somewhere, there was a big banner, "Gentle Giant." <laughs> it was lovely mm -hmm. to see that. We we got we got a, a really good uh, reception at both of those uh, huge concerts. And of course, we we did uh, quite a few concerts with Yes. Um, they they went pretty well. Yeah, I would think that would be a good pairing. Yeah, it was. Uh, they were they were doing the uh, the crab tour, you know the, that huge right stage set thing uh, at the time. Seventy six. Yeah, that would be seventy six. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so they they used to put a, a curtain like a net curtain in front of the crab and all that stuff. And there was, there was a Rickenbacker base carpet leading up to uh, where Mr. Squire stood. And my drums would be perched just in front of that. But they, we, we, uh, we went down well at, at the S concerts. Well, how, how did you feel about um when things were changing over for Giant into the rock vein, into the more straight down the middle, how did you feel about those records? Uh, Missing Peace, Giant for a Day, Civilian. Missing Peace, I, I like very much. I think there's, um, there's a good mix of stuff on there. Uh, there's very gianty kind of things, and there's very semi-pop you know, accessible kind of things on turning there. Turning around? Uh, well, turning around was uh, insisted upon oh, by really? the record company. That was written and that was recorded in a day, the whole thing, uh, because the because Chrysalis wanted um, uh, a single. Well, wasn't Two Weeks in Spain the single? Uh Hang on. It certainly oh, was played a lot. I remember it was played a lot it, on the radio. It came out as a single, yeah. yeah. But we turning around was an afterthought. That was certainly not part of the album. Ah. I think it was on the, the later releases, but it um ah. if you look back at the uh, the album when it came out, I don't think turning around was on the vinyl. I'm not sure. But I know we went in separately to record it, as we did with the um, "Power and the Glory" the single. Oh yeah, right. No, that was also an afterthought. Huh. Well, I like "Missing Peace" and the way we recorded that. That was the first album that we ever did as a band in a studio uh, with like a live setup. Oh, really? I had a, it was done in Hilvarnbeck in, um, in uh, Holland. Mm -hmm. And we had a drum riser and we were in a semicircle. Um, and it was all recorded at the same time, the basic in instruments. Uh, Kerry had his keyboard set up there, Raymond that was going DI, but of course we, we were getting it. Uh, 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 Gary was going, I think he had, an, he had an amp there. But whatever we played w went straight onto the record. And we were quite well rehearsed for us. We'd, we'd already taken part of it on tour. I forget was, which part. <laughs> was interview recorded th that way? Because it seems like the song interview, you would have been playing together. That was all overdub. Um, 
I think so, yeah. Or like a rocker, like another show that that was separate. Also, that wasn't the full band playing. Uh, by the time we got to interview, I think we'd started to change things around a bit. I know that. And you guys uh, never recorded to a click. No. I wish I had. Sometimes. I wish you had. Yeah. Well, I don't know, man. It sounds like you did. That's why I asked because, you know, the fans that listen and there's not even a hi hat sort of clicking on some of those chamber music sections and, you know, like or beginning of Last Voyage or, you know, any of the pieces where like Advent of Panurge where there's there's no drums, you're just waiting. And the time is just moving through just so perfectly. No click, right? No click. <laughs> so I, I began counting it out on the hi hat, yeah, on intros and stuff like that. And you know the old trick of, of stop, stop the hi hat, two beats before, right? So they don't have to scrub it. They don't have to to uh, erase it. Mm -hmm. So you count, 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 and then on the the last two beats you leave off, but the count is is there. So. They know it. Well, it's also a, a thing where we're hearing a band that plays really well together. I think that's another thing that impressed me about Giant was just how well everything fit together. And that music in the hands of lesser players, I think, would be a mess. So it's it's really a testament to you guys of how you knew how it worked. It wasn't I, I hate when people say that like Giant was experimental in some way because I don't think it was. I think it was really clear what what the experiment was. I think the results of the experiment had already been released. Mm. That this was it's just running like a, a beautiful machine. Um, well, the, the the machine was kind of getting kind of shaky uh, after uh, missing piece. I'm afraid we we were kind of starting to try things. You know. It, it, the, the, it needed a good service and Giant for a Day was not the service it needed. Well, why is that, John? I don't know. I really don't know. I think the guys sat down and they thought, what do we have to do? What do we have to do? Because, it's, you know, the record companies were going, nah, progressive. Nah. Uh, give us something that we can that the radio stations are going to play, that we can sell, you know, and it kind of started to get sidetracked. I, I think we got a bit lost um, going into Giant for a Day, the whole concept uh, and the, the songs on it were just throw away mm. the bulk of them. I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of good things on there. Uh, Spooky Boogie is particularly good. Um, but we did, you know, no wonder nobody liked it. And how did you feel about Civilian? I love Civilian. It's a rock album. It's an uh, 80s, pre-80s, 80s rock album. I mean, I, I really love playing on that. Did, it, uh, are there plans for any other giant uh, reissues, remixes, uh, anything like that coming up? Well, I believe so. I believe that uh, Interview is next and then Missing Peace. I think Mr. Wilson is going to wave his magic wand over it. And uh, of course, Derek's son, who's, um, who's into a lot of visuals, is... Uh, 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 taking a lot of interest in, in the band and doing a lot of promotion on the band at the moment. That's Noah? That's Noah, yeah. He's a great guy. He's got some, some good ideas. Well, I think his videos have really helped uh, promote the music to other people as well, the visual world of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've enjoyed their videos. They're, I don't know, it's, they're very modern. Yeah. Very modern indeed. Well, I think it fits with modern music. I mean, to me, Gentle Giant, not much of it has aged, really. 
a lot of it, I, you know, power and the glory, you'd be lucky to, you know, have a, a rock band that could do that today. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot, it's a good album. There's some great stuff on there. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's become apt. Now, you know, with the, the, your ex-president, mm. power, power and the Glory is, is uh, definitely describes him and our current prime minister. It definitely his progression through his prime ministerial uh, goings on, as it were. The uh, it, it, it's. It suited the time because of Mr. Nixon. And that's why I think a lot of people caught on to it. And now it's come back to, it's relevant again. It sure it is. It's the abuse of, of power that's going on. And uh, it's, it's very, very sad to see that power being abused so much when it could be put to so much good. So true. Anyway, I, I don't want to get political. I might get shot. Well. <laughs> But certainly, you're right. The relevance of power and the glory did not uh, get by me in the last few years. <laughs> you know, aspirations so sincere. Yeah. By the way, I always wanted to ask you. That is that in the part when you get it, or do you come up with that beat? Raymond, Ray said, can you play this triplet? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, well, go away and learn, learn it. So I went away for 10 minutes. And, uh, you know, it, it, with the foot, it's just a matter of where, where you put it and, and what you're doing. Yeah. And it took me a while. Uh, about half an hour, I think, before I, I was, and it was a bit stumbly, but, but he said, can you play this? And I said, no. I tried. <laughs> I said, no. And he said, well, go and learn it. I said, oh, all right then. <laughs> it's nice to have a challenge. Yeah, oh, yeah. That, that's why I went away and learned it. Instead of saying, you must be joking, go away. And it is the perfect motor for that particular piece. Absolutely. You know, it takes it takes the first part of the the bar, and sets up the rest. Uh huh. Oh, well, once he played me the tune, I could see what he was on about. Yeah, right. You know, when it when it all started fitting together, and well, once once I'd learned it, it was a positive delight to play, to get it all right because you know you. Every single time it's got to be right. And then when, when the phrasing changes. Yeah. There's so much, so much <laughs> stuff there, man. Yeah. I mean, Raymond tested me to, you know, tested me to destruction, nearly. What, were, first... what were his most challenging pieces? Boys in the band. For sure. When he played me that, I said, no, Raymond, <laughs> go home and write something else. Well, when, there aren't a lot of pure instrumentals in Giant, and that, that's a great one. Woo! Do you know, when, when we recorded that, I didn't really know it. We'd had hardly any rehearsal. So I did, it was one of those, you know, count in and pray. <laughs> And the wow. sigh of relief when you you know the, the relief that flowed through me when we finished playing the the intro. I was like, oh, and then by the time I kind of settled down, oh, here it comes again. Because <laughs> he he said, oh, just phrase phrase through it, because you know it'd be stupid to try and just play those things with us. Mm. He said, play whatever you like. <laughs> and there's one cracking mistake in it. 
And I keep telling people there's a terrible mistake in it and nobody knows where it is. I don't, I don't. think I do. I don't know. Don't well, tell I'm, me. I, I had uh, uh, Jonathan Mover came here to the house one time to do an interview for Drum Drumhead magazine. And uh, I was telling him the same story. He said, I never heard that. I said, hang on a minute. And I put it on and he listened to it. I said, did you hear it? He said, no. <laughs> so I put it on again and I said, there. He said, no, there's nothing wrong with that. You hear things that we don't hear. Yeah, well, to me, I got completely lost, but kind of bluffed my way out of it. Is that going into the quiet part in the middle? No, it, it's in the middle of one of the, the riffs. Ah, okay. Well, that's, there's the challenge for, for all the listeners out there. I want a timestamp in the comments. <laughs> we'll, we'll expose Pugwash for the fraud that he is for leaving a mistake on a Gentle Giant record. <laughs> it, it wasn't up to me. I said, you can't leave that on there. Let me go down and do it again. No, no, it's fine. Leave it. Yeah, right. Well, I think that, that, you know, Giant would appreciate the fact that everything else was great. And, if, you know, if there's one stray note, you get into this all the time with singers. They're, try they're trying to have pitch perfect on every note. But the emotion isn't there. Would you rather have the emotion or would you rather have perfection? Mm -hmm. What do you win? What do you gain? What do you lose? It's, it's, an, it's, it's always an eternal yeah. question, you know? Well, I I can listen to a record and know if it's been played to a click. Because you, you know with a click, you, you sit on a click. Yeah. You let the click do the work. Otherwise, you, you get ahead of it. So, uh, and you, so you don't get that expression, I don't think. Well, it's a different energy. It sure. is, yeah. Yes, it's like controlled, isn't it? You don't, you don't get that diving over a cliff break. When we spoke years ago, you had told me uh, the disposition of the, the classic drum set that you use on all those records. Where, where is that drum kit today? It's about eight feet away. Is it? So, because at the oh. time you were you were talking about maybe donating it or that Ringo was interested in it. Is that true? Oh, uh, Ringo? No, I don't. Because he collects drum sets. Yeah, he probably collects it all his own, but he wouldn't want to. No, mine. he has Carl Palmer's metal drum kit from 77. Lucky him. Well, luckily, no one has to move it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, mine's still, mine's still upstairs. Um, I did intend giving it to uh, Kerry's son. Um, but Kerry said, no, no, uh, you hang on to it. You know, you keep it and it's in such, it's in pretty bad uh, shape. Well, you beat the hell out of it for a number of years, didn't you? I did, yes, I'm afraid so. And I, I let the, the snare get too close to the, to the, uh, the tom. So it, it's worn away the, worn away the, uh, the finish on it. It's a shame, really. But that's I mean, very common. And, but I, I, did, I was watching a review the other day. At the, there was this guy reviewing um, the live version of For Nobody. And he, he said, oh, look at that drummer. He's beating them like they owe him money. <laughs> well, you, you did hit hard, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, but again, like I say, that, that was a huge part of, of what I think made the music work, what, br what brought Giant to a larger audience. You know, you could play in a, in a larger room and everyone would know where the time was and everyone would know what the feel was. And, mm. you know, so, uh, you know, just, just the standout, standout band and what you brought to it. I just think is incredible, John. And speaking with you today is, is much more than a pleasure. It's really an honor.
always a, a pleasure to speak to you as well. You know, you're a drummer, so we, we know what we're talking about. We know what we're talking about. Maybe nobody out there does. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope they do. No, they do. They do. They do. Because Ch Chancellor Giant now is becoming much more, uh, what's the word, Pr prevalent in in its presence because you know we see hip hop artists are 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 sampling gentle giant tunes yeah. and, and people are covering gentle giant tunes you see all these bands now on youtube that are playing just the same or on reflection at some college somewhere yeah there, there was one there was one i i saw i i only caught it once where there was a school brass band, you know, to play on the on the football fields before the, you know, hundreds of well, not hundreds, dozens of them marching up and down playing a gentle giant tune, which I thought was incredible. But I, I like the the strange arrangements that they do, uh, little string quintets and the choir and stuff like that. There, there's lots of um, Lots of very interesting takes on, on the giant stuff. Kerry should be very, very proud that they take him so seriously. You know, all these music teachers in these schools. Um, I think so. He, deserves it. he absolutely deserves it. You're right. Uh, you know, just a level above as a composer and the fact that that, you know, 50 years later, basically we're looking at this stuff is still appreciated. And you know what? I always say it stands up when you can take it out of its context and put it into a string quartet or put it into a brass marching band or putting it. And then you hear the lines and then you hear the music and you hear the logic and you hear the internal machinery working and you say, ah, undeniable. It still mm -hmm. works as a string quartet. Yeah, I agree with you totally. Yeah. Well, John, you know, it's just such a pleasure. I, I want everyone to know how much I love you and how much I love Gentle Giant and how much I appreciate your time. And anyone from Gentle Giant is, is always welcome to come on this program and talk with me and tell me some of the lurid details. No, but seriously, the, the, <laughs> the making of the music and the, the way the music stands today, can't say enough. Uh, and uh, I, anything that you, you wanna tell the fans out there right now? Oh, just thank you for being fans. I mean, I really, really appreciate it. it it's uh, it, it's great. It's absolutely wonderful not to be just stuck in a corner as some old has been, you know, that uh, that never did anything. That that the legacy has lasted this long is absolutely amazing. And got the Shulmans and Mr. Veneer and Mr. Green to thank for that. You know, uh, they just they were just such wonderful people to work with and play with and spend a very, very happy eight years with. And it's all all there on the recordings and it's all proof, proof in the pudding, as they say. Well, the recordings will be there long after I've gone. And that that's the greatest thing is that it's it's a legacy. It's it's there forever. Like old movies, like old great movies, you know. Right. Old, old great music. Um, I'm not saying that it was wonderful or anything like that. It was, but I, I think it stood up as a particular, oh, uh, example of its time. Oh, very much so. A stand, it stands out, I think, as an example of that time in, in the loftiest. I think uh, ambitions of that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a shame that you know things, fashions, music, fashions changed. That that was it. That, that that's that's the way it always goes. I think it is. It is. It's unavoidable. Um, but the the fact that now you're getting a second listen, you know, that Gentle Giant has has really now risen above. I think so many of the, its contemporaries, because we're, you know, sometimes it takes, Pat Metheny said this to me, sometimes it takes 30 years <laughs> to catch on to something. Yeah, well, good music 
I mean, you you can't just rubbish and throw away good music. It'll always stand up on its own. Yeah, and was no. the whole, you know, the entire reason for doing the Mahavishnu project was to just say, well, here's this music. Other people are playing it. Sorry, it's not the original band, but here's this music. Uh -huh. Isn't it cool? And didn't it have interesting parts that work together and worked off of yeah. each other? And, and, and look, we can interpret it. We can do it as jazz. We can play our own solos and we can do our own thing with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot, a lot that can be done still with giant music. Um, also, I, I work with Mike Keneally, so we're always influenced by giant. There's always some sort of giant thing in there. People who, who, who know Mike's music or don't know Mike's music. Mike's great. Mike's great. And there's a piece on his Scambot 2 record called Pretzel that is as close as you'll get to someone being able to write in the style of Kerry Muneer. <laughs> And I will tell you something really funny, John Weathers. When I was recording the drum part for Pretzel, Mike gave me one of my favorite music directions of all time. He said to me, in this part, play the cymbals as if Michael Giles was the drummer in Gentle Giant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's a task. And, and I figured out you know, because I, I knew that's our visual, that's our uh, musical language, because I knew exactly what he meant. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I knew exactly yeah. what he meant by symbols, Michael Giles, giant. Now, mm -hmm. I, I, before we split, I did want to tell people, you told me one of the funniest things I've ever heard about, about music. And I, and I think that the subject was dream theater, this band dream theater. And you said to me, Dream theater, you remember this? You're smiling. Dream theater reminds me of a band. Uh, it sounds like Deep Purple met the Mahavishnu Orchestra in a drum shop. <laughs> and that, I swear that was original. It's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> Apt, as you might say, it, you know, it, it's quite good and, and fun and true <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well i wasn't being de derogatory about the band no just, but that's sort of what it sounds like well when when i saw them that's what hit me yeah well john pugwatch weathers i am so happy to, to be talking with you we're all, almost going on two hours now so we're going to call it i think we should just for the sake of your voice and uh, and we'll do it again, I hope. Well, I really, really enjoyed talking to you, Greg. Really have. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you, everyone, for listening to the 50th episode of the podcast, where my guest has been the drummer from Gentle Giant, John Weathers. And he's one of the greats. And he's with us. And he's talking about all this stuff. And everyone be, better be listening. So we will... Uh, we will reconvene at another time, maybe when an, another giant uh, reissue comes out. Well, yeah. Anytime, anywhere, any place. I'm yours. Well, I hope your, uh, your, uh, your evening or the rest of your day goes well. And thanks for everybody who's, uh, who's going to watch this. I hope you all have a good day, too. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye, Greg. <laughs>